Thank you for joining me today. And I'm blessed and honored actually to have as my guest, Jean Thomas Gomulka, correct? Jean right. <laughs> <laughs> um, is a sexual abuse victims advocate, investigative reporter and screenwriter. Wow, you were, you're a screenwriter, really? For what, TV, movies? Well, I just finished one entitled Broken Vows. Ooh, okay. it's, it's, it's a full length uh, feature movie. Wow, okay. And uh, let's see, and former seminary formatter and instructor with an STL. What's an STL? That's a uh, licentiate in sacred theology. Okay. That's a um, European type of uh, degree. It's like a year beyond the master's. Okay. Exactly. From the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome. That's the Angelicum, right? Yes, the, exactly. Okay. Former Navy chaplain, captain, and member of the U.S. Marine Corps Inspector General team, ordained a priest for the Altoona Johnstown Diocese, and later made a prelate of honor, Monsignor, by St. Pope John Paul II. Wow. Thank you, Gene, for, for joining me. God bless you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on your program, Joseph. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I became aware of your work um, a while ago. Um, I, I, I encourage people to go to Gene's website and I'll link it in uh, the show's description. Um, I wanted to cover today mainly this document that Gene has posted for free on the internet so you can read it on his website. Um, anything that's more complicated than like a one or two page article, I usually print out. Um, so I did print out this and it's Gosh, I was reading this over the last few days and it's thorough, it's documented. I went to UC Berkeley and I, my degree's in history. So I understand footnoting and I understand documenting of sources and you did a very good job of that, I must say. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. My, my book has like 300 footnotes. So this is really well-researched and this is just thankless work. I'm telling you, I'm thanking you. But, um, cause I've done, um, not as ex extensive or as thorough as this, but I've done some looking into the problem of uh, pre-sex abuse and the cover-up in the Catholic Church. And it's just work that I think I did just out of love. I think just out of love for the, for the survivors and, and the victims and, and um, just a, a hope and a prayer that no one else will have to suffer as other people have and as I have. What? So I just wanted to ask you first, what, that's a big question, what inspired you to do this kind of work? It's, it's because it's, it's very, like I said, it's thankless work and it's, it's not pleasant work either. Um, no, it's, it's, well, it is and it isn't. I mean, it's, it, for me, it's, um, it's fulfilling, but there are times when I, I just, uh, at the end of the day, I say to myself, I need a drink, you know, <laughs> just need to relax and it, because it can be very uh, <clears throat> depressing because of the, the the egregious nature of so many of these abuse cases. And, uh, but what really I think started me off was uh, <clears throat> when I was first ordained, I was assigned to a parish in Penn State and State College, Pennsylvania, and the, the pastor, Monsignor Fleming, put me in charge of the altar boys. And, and I had about 80 altar boys. It's a large parish. By the time I left State College five years later, we were up to about 170. And uh, uh, I loved those kids like they were my own children. And the reason was, too, my classmates from college, you know, were getting married, having families, having children. And as a priest, you know, I was not allowed to marry and have a family and children. So those children, those servers, those altar boys were very, very, very important in my life. And, and I still keep in touch with a lot of them. Just last week, I, I drove uh, three hours, three and a half hours north of you, you know, to uh, Ventura. Where, no, you're in San Francisco. Right. Well, it was south of you, about three and a half hours north of here to attend the uh, retirement ceremony of one of my former altar boys that I met when he was 10 years old. He's just finished 37 years 
of the governmental and military service and asked me to speak at his retirement and said that I was the one who motivated him, you know, to, uh, to join the Navy and so forth. So my point is, is that my close relationship with those young men that I still maintain to this day uh, made me feel that when, whenever I hear about an, an abuse case where someone comes to me and, and relates abuse in their life, I think of those victims as if they were like my own children. And I, I think it was such a blessing for me at, at that stage of my development as a young priest to have that those kinds of relationships and experiences, which I really regret young priests today cannot have because they can't even be alone, you know, with, with Billy and Bobby without an adult being present. And they can't develop those kind of uh, mentoring relationships, you know, that I enjoyed. So that's what, what motivated me to do this work is, is my, uh, my, my love for those kids. And you have to understand too, there were two other young associates in that parish with me, one for four years and one for one year. Both of those young associates, by my own age, we discovered years later, without my knowledge or the knowledge of the pastor, were hitting on my altar boys, were abusing them. Now, both of those priests are out of ministry today, but the damage was done. So, uh, but you see, the other problem too is when I look at those two young priests that I served with, I regret what they did, but at the same time, I pity those priests because both of those priests, uh, unlike myself who went to a, a co-ed uh, Catholic high school in Johnstown, both of those priests who were abusing and those young, young men, uh, both of them were products of high school seminaries. Mm. And so during their period of psychosexual development, they were being groomed. They were yeah. being groomed by the faculty members, by upperclassmen. And they had no idea, you know, that this grooming was a form of abuse. Yeah. And because of that, years later now, when they become priests, they tried the same thing with other young men, the same age that they were when they were groomed. Only now to find out that not all of these young men like that. So, so the, the Catholic Church created, I mean, even before the whole LGBTQ you know, movement came about, the Catholic Church uh, was very much involved in creating yeah. sexual predators in these high school seminaries. And, yeah. and, and that is, is, is why you have so many bishops today and cardinals and archbishops who were products of those seminaries. And that's why today more than half of the priests and the bishops uh, are, are homosexuals. Yeah. You, you just um, outlined pretty much everything I wanted to talk to you about. <laughs> thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, now, those high school seminaries, they used to be called minor seminaries, right? Yes. Okay. So, I mean, I wasn't around when, when they were functioning, but um, I suppose that if a young man in Catholic school or maybe in public school showed any sort of inclination towards the priesthood or towards spirituality or religious, uh, you know, religious uh, bent, they were sort of picked out or plucked out and put into uh, a minor seminary. Is that, is that how it functioned? Well, it did. As a matter of fact, interestingly, when I was in eighth grade, I had two models in my life, my brother who was in the Navy and the young priest who was just assigned to our Polish parish, Father Bernard Szabotsky. Wow. And I told my parents, I said, mom and dad, I think I wanna be a priest like Father Bernard. I'd like to go away to the seminary after I graduate from uh, grade school. Right, I wanted to go to St. Mary's uh, College uh, in Orchard Lake, Michigan for their high school program, St. Cyril Methodius, you know? So uh, fortunately, my brother was home on leave from the Navy at that same time. And my brother's sitting at table listening this. to this yeah. conversation and he says, no way. Is he going to go away to some seminary? You know, he's too young to know, you know, that he's able, if he wants to give up having a wife and children. 
let him go to the high school here. And if he's still inclined to do that, let him decide later on. He's too young to make that decision at this point in his life. And my parents, fortunately, agreed with my brother. And, my they brother. To me, and I said, OK, no problem. I'll go to Bishop of Court. <laughs> Yeah, I, I read that in one of your articles, and it was smart, smart brother. So yeah. <laughs> I, I, I want to talk about the, I kind of wanted the focus of our discussion of It's All Right With You is sure. is grooming, because I think you talked about it in your um, articles, but the, the issue of grooming is also sort of in mainstream media right now because of the so-called don't say gay bill in um, a Florida. Um, and I think there's some confusion, especially surprisingly among Roman Catholics about what grooming actually is. Um, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, stranger abductions are something that people I think are familiar with and, and they do occur. Um, but most often people who are sex children or even, even adults and vulnerable adults who are sexually abused are abused by someone that they know. Um, for let's, since the focus of, of your writing, at least in this instance, was with seminarians, let's talk about seminarians. I mean, I, I have spoken with seminarians and I've, I've also just spoken with pre-sex abuse survivors who, who are not in a seminary. None of them, I, I'm being hyperbolic here, but none of them were walking down the street and a priest, you know, grabbed them, threw them in a van you know, and sexually abused them, they were groomed. They knew their abuser. A lot of times they knew their abuser quite well. Um, so I wanted to talk specifically about how the grooming process takes place. Um, I think you very rightly um, connect a lot of um, the priest abuse problem in the Catholic Church with homosexuality because the majority of victims have been males, um, post-pubescent males. Um, now I have talked with, and I was abused, you know, by a Catholic priest who very much, I wouldn't say used, but utilized, you know, sexual orientation in terms of the grooming process. And that's been the story with a lot of survivors that I have spoken with. And um, because I think there's a false meme or a false belief out there, um, especially sadly with some victims groups that I, and I don't know why they've taken this stance. It's, it's sort of a political position, but they, and I, I'm curious to what you think about this is that um, some Catholics, and um, you know, lay Catholics and clergy believe that a lot of, or a number of priests were just opportunistic abusers, that um, they abused whoever was available. And um, their argument is that boys were more available than girls. <clears throat> but I've spoken with female survivors of pre-sex abuse and um, their abusers, abused females and they had no problem, um, you know, accessing victims. So um, that, that, that argument has always rung false to me that it's, that the preponderances, the preponderance of male victims is only because of opportunistic abusers. I don't, I don't think it's true. I know there, there was a lot in that. It wasn't really a question, but there was a lot in that statement. So. Well, people like Supich with whom I studied in Rome right. and, and others who advanced that argument, uh, you have to understand too, do not want to talk about homosexuality because it's too close to their own existence. So, so you, uh, you have to understand, you have to consider the source of the people who are making, you know, these arguments. Uh, for example, Supic and even the Pope himself would say, well, there's no relationship between homosexuality and pedophilia. That there is many uh, 
people who are pedophiles who are abusing boys as there are girls. That is true. But the problem in the Catholic Church with regard to clerical abuse has nothing to do, very little, less than 10% of the victims are uh, prepubescent children. The real problem in the Roman Catholic Church, as was the as is the case also, for example, in the Boy Scouts of America, mm. involves a febophilia, right. the sexual abuse of you know post adolescent post pubescent uh, children. So they're basically hitting on teenage boys, and and it, it's the the the, the, the uh, man boy you know relationship. And, and that's why I, I sent you that those studies, even from the gay community, that show that about 73% of homosexuals have admitted, you know, to having come on to a teenage boy in their life. So that that temptation is is acting out. But going back to what you you said about the grooming, you have to understand too that as you're you're absolutely right. <clears throat> Very few of those young men who were uh, preyed upon <clears throat> were were uh, in, even in their own minds uh, set up as as if they were abused they were they were groomed and uh, uh, when you talk about most of them being friends from my own even experience at the North American College in Rome I was I was approached twice uh, two two uh, seminarians uh, upperclassmen came on to me and interestingly both of those young men were part of my small group of, let's say, if I had identified 10 best friends in, in Rome at that time at the North American College, these two were part of that 10 best friends. You know, so while I'm working on my final exam, you know, studying, with the, it's hot, the window's open, my shirt's off, you know, who comes into my room? You know, but one of my friends starts massaging my chest. No, I, I threw him out, you know, but again, and the other one who, who tried another act, both of these uh, young men, I perceived at the time, I thought they were my very, very good friends. I didn't realize that, you know, they wanted to befriend me because they wanted something else out of me. You know, at that point, you know, when you're young, handsome, you know, good looking, whatever, you know, you're a target. Uh, I mean, and, and so you'll find that uh, many of my victims, I find very interestingly, are when you look at the pictures of these uh, seminarians. What do you what do you what do you mean, Gene, by my victims? Don't well, vic the ones the, the victims that I deal with. OK, in other words, the, those uh, people like the uh, the one young man I'm working with now who was was drugged and sodomized by his pastor, you know, uh, and, and others who, who were, 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 uh, uh, were harmed. Sorry, I, sorry I call to, them sorry. my victims in the sense that I, I'm their advocate. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. What, in what capacity are you, are you advocating for them? As, um... Well, what I, what I do is, it's a number of things. Uh, one, sometimes I will, I will uh, help them find a, an attorney that may take on their case. Sometimes I will write an article and publish it about their case. Sometimes I will uh, try to work behind the scenes with people. Right now, for example, I'm working uh, in, in a case involving the Ukrainian Catholic Church. Now, uh, I'm, I'm working with, with, with a, a friend with whom I studied with in Rome, who's, who's uh, a member of, who's in, in a position of authority within that church to try to handle this at the lowest level possible and get the priest who uh, came on to this young man, a uh, seminarian, and have him removed from ministry. But if they don't cooperate, then we have to go to another level. Then I have a lawyer in, uh, in Stamford, Connecticut, where that seminary is located, who will then uh, possibly take on his case. So that's what I do. I basically work with, with attorneys. I also work with investigators if I don't investigate it myself. Thank God for you. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Um, you were at the, so you were at the North American College, the NAC in, in Rome, right? 
from 1971 to 75. I went there in my second year of theology after doing first theology in St. Francis Seminary in Loretto, Pennsylvania. Then I was ordained in 74, returned to Rome to complete my licentiate in sacred theology at the Angelicum. And that sort of predation was going on at, at that time, at the Well, seminary. I mean, right. I mean, if you consider it, two, two friends came on to me, you know, and then you have to understand too, I, I'd, the, say, I'd say that's predation. Oh, absolutely. Well, you have to understand. Remember, the, 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 uh, I told you there were two priests in the parish that I was stationed with who later on we found out. Well, guess what? One of those priests was my classmate who, all, who I studied with in Rome. In other words, we were ordained together. The bishop laid his hands on me and then... A minute later, he laid his hands on Bob, you know, who was uh, then uh, then I was later on. I, I returned to Rome. Then I came back and was assigned to the same parish he was assigned to in State College. And so then years later, he returned uh, uh, at the request of the rector, uh, uh, then uh, uh, Monsignor <clears throat> Edwin O'Brien, to be the academic dean of the North American College, where uh, he never completed his tour. And then later on, it was revealed that, that he was re re relieved because of sexual problems. Did, so, uh, Gene, did you ever report that unwanted advance while you were there at the, at the college? Did you? Well, when, when, that, when, when Otto came into my room and did that, <clears throat> you know, it happened so fast, you know, I said, get out of here, you know? So at the time, I didn't, you know, like a lot of victims who, you know, it, 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 at the time it happens, you're sort of like, what the, you know, what's going on here? And so uh, because he never tried it again or whatever, you know, I'm wondering, look, is, is, is a seminary like a prison, you know, where, where there's no women and you're, 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 you're doing things in, in showers that you would not ordinarily do? To... <laughs> so I, I, I didn't know at the time, but I, Interestingly, I discovered years later, when I Googled him, I found out that shortly after he was ordained, that he was accused of abusing a young man in, in because he was from, from Brooklyn. But the case was dismissed because they didn't have enough evidence against him. Then later on, DiMarzio, Bishop DiMarzio, his bishop in Brooklyn, put him in charge of sex abuse. Right. He was in charge of the safe environment program. It's put, like putting the fox in charge of the hen house, you know? So, I mean, that's that's what we're dealing with here. We're, we're dealing with people, and I've seen this in many, many, many dioceses. It's happened, same thing with Regali in St. Louis, where he put Timothy Dolan, when he made him his auxiliary bishop, in charge of abuse. So that when, when Chris O'Leary, who was abused by Father Valentine, came to to, to auxiliary bishop dolan and said hey you know i'm here because you you know that father valentine who lived with you in the rectory was abusing me oh i don't know that and so in other words you put people in charge oftentimes in the safe environment program who are there basically to s prevent people from bringing soup and discouraging them and trying to talk them into believing that what would happen to them was just in their mind that never really happened in real life yeah. Did did I sorry to go back to this again, but I, I, I'm 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 interested in in the dynamics of what goes on in a seminary. But after after that fellow seminarian made that advance, did, did you talk to anybody about it? I mean any fellow no, seminarian? I never mentioned it. Uh you, you see a lot of victims, you know, will wait, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. Because you see, uh at the time that it happens, you're trying to figure out yeah. what was really going on there. Was this was this really a, a, a sexual act or was this just horsing around? You don't know because you you want to give this person maybe the benefit of the doubt. Uh. Uh, because in this case, now had he got, uh, reached for my you know privates, that would have been different, you know. But that's that's how grooming begins it begins oh know. absolutely it does it, it, it's it's you know the massage you know that you know, and, and that's the, the same thing that happened with uh former seminarian anthony gorgia 
at the North American College, where he witnessed Father Adam Park of the Archdiocese of Washington, ordained by Theodore McCarrick, doing that to one of the fall a fellow seminarian who then later on came up to back, back to Gorge and said, well, I noticed you witnessed what he was doing. I don't like what he's doing. And it, it, it really disturbs me. And then when Gorgias spoke with other seminarians, you know, they also related that they felt the park was, was, was kind of strange yeah. and maybe a, a predator. Yeah. I want to, I want to talk about that case later too. It's, it's tragic. Um, so in the beginning of your of your study here, um, I think you're pretty methodical. Well, you're pretty methodical in all the points you're trying to make. And the, you know, you argue that the majority of priests are homosexual, either yes. by inclination or behavior. So, and then uh, I can testify to, to this point that I think the um, in certain religious orders, I would say the percentage of homosexual priests is higher than in the diocesan priesthood. Let's say, I'm gonna say the Jesuits, the Paulists, and the OFMs. Absolutely. All the studies show that. Yep, yep. And, and the people, that when you speak with Jesuits, for example, Father Paul Shaughnessy uh, was, is a Jesuit priest we served together in the military, and before I came out with my article uh, addressing this problem in America magazine, he published an article in uh, uh, the New Catholic World in which he lamented the deaths of many of his brother Jesuits who were dying of AIDS. And when, when that article came out, he was called in by Arch, then Archbishop O'Brien, who was in charge of the military archdiocese, and he was threatened with being thrown out of the military if he ever wrote about that again. Because you see, again, it, it, it touched the nerve because O'Brien, you know, like many bishops, you know, today uh, are, are homosexuals. Yeah. And, and I got to tell you, Gene, how I got interested in this topic is it's, it, I mean, it's, it's a, it was, it's a, I got it involved, personally involved. <laughs> Because um, I, I was born and raised here in San Francisco. It's, it's very liberal. And the Catholic Church has always been very leftist here. So, um, I mean, I was, I was groomed and molested by a, a Catholic priest when I was 16. And then not unusual is that a number, I want to talk about that with you later, a number of men who are um, sexually abused by Catholic priests later come out as gay. Yes. Um, I have to say the majority of survivors that are male that I have spoken to now identify as gay. Um, it's just another tragic piece of the puzzle. But and then when I moved to San Francisco, and lived as a gay man, I, you know, I met several um, priests, Catholic priests who were homosexual and, and actively homosexual. And um, I always thought the, and then I, I, I left that life, and for some inexplicable reason, I returned to the Catholic Church. Um, but I always thought that this gay problem, if you want to call it that, in the Catholic priesthood was sort of endemic to San Francisco, certain dioceses. It was just, you know, it, it wasn't something, you know, it was just, it was very local. That's what I thought. And then I, I started writing about some of my experiences and people began, Catholics began to, began to write me from all around the United States, how specifically, not so much that um, they had been sexually abused or that um, family members had been sexually abused, but that... Um, they themselves or people that they knew or people in their family, what I would call had been groomed in these LGBTQ ministries that are in every major diocese and in some smaller ones. I guess at that point, I was, my eyes were wide open and I was like, well, this is a bigger problem than in San Francisco that there, and I don't know if these priests are, are necessarily identify as gay or that they're they they um participate in homosexual behavior 
but they're certainly promoting, you know, LGBT uh, activism and they're activists. And I was like, wow, this is a big, a big problem. And every time I went down these rat holes where I tried to research or something about a parish, it was always a Jesuit. I always found a Jesuit, even if it wasn't so much a Jesuit parish, there was always some sort of Jesuit um, connection. And um, I mean, I, and I kind of traced it back because, because of my background is history. I, I traced it back to John J. McNeil, the, um, the famous Jesuit in the 1970s who wrote the, the Church and the Homosexual and was really one of the first, I guess, gay, I guess you could say like celebrity priests who, who went on mainstream media and, and talked about all these things. And then I found it interesting that it wasn't that long ago in 2001 you actually wrote an article for America, which is which is the Jesuit, you know, owned and operated magazine. And, and now the Jesuits, 21 years later, they've gone full LGBTQ activist. So, I mean, this sort of article would never run. Oh, now. absolutely. You're it's, absolutely it's, right. That's, it's, <laughs> it's fascinating. That article got me in a lot of trouble, you have to understand. Uh, <laughs> with, with, the, with the Jesuits or who? who, who no, I mean, the, it, no, the problem, it got me in the trouble with Archbishop O'Brien, the, the gay, you know, military archbishop, who interestingly <clears throat> uh, was actually the force behind my writing that article. You see, what happened was, O'Brien contacted me because I had just received the Alfred Thayer Mahan Award uh, for my, my literary works in, in the military. And he said, well, you're, you're, you're a reputed writer now, an author and so forth. How about doing an article for me uh, in the Priest magazine promoting the chaplaincy? I said, sure. So I wrote an article in the Priest magazine, but then as soon as I finished that and it was published, I thought, well, you know, I, I, I said all the great things that are going on, but I didn't say about some of the problems we have too. So I decided to give, to have a more balanced perspective on, on chaplaincy and so forth. I decided to pen an article for America. And I had been, I'd been published like three times before that in America on, on other uh, uh, issues. So having written for America in the past, uh, especially in regard to like the pre-shortage issue and so forth, I, uh, I thought they may accept it. They did. Uh, only when, uh, 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 when O'Brien read it, he didn't look at it from the perspective of my encouraging uh, people to be a supportive of their priests who are now living alone, home alone in the priesthood. Uh, they saw it from the perspective of where I use that example of the five priests in the military, you got the trouble, where I said living alone can cause you to be tempted in ways that you know if you had a wife and kids you would not be tempted. You know, right. In other words, if, if you're if you're married, you have a wife and kids, are you going to bring a prostitute to your home? <laughs> I don't think so. Right. You know, so so in the end, uh, I uh, when I wrote that article, uh, that was right after right after that appeared. Uh, that's when I got a phone call from a, a chaplain friend who said, "I know someone who's not going to be a bishop now." <laughs> Exactly. Uh, so, so no, I mean, it, it was, uh, it was the, the Jesuits absolutely uh, uh, have, have a, a very serious problem. And, and who is the number one Jesuit in the world today? James Martin. No. Oh, oh, Fr oh, Francis, I'm sorry. Yes. And so if you look, if you look at his history, <laughs> but you, you see, you know, I mean, of course, no. the American media uh, has given him a pass. They do not want to look critically at Francis. So that, for example, you know, we know <clears throat> that that when he wrote his in his book in Heaven and Earth, he wrote that there in his entire time in the Archdiocese of of Buenos Aires, it has 2.7 million Catholics. He said there was not one case of abuse. Uh, I mean. If you're going to lie, lie well. Yeah, that, that, but, yeah. But, but so, so we know, and, and so all the people who are interviewed, even you, videos that are available on YouTube, you know, uh, sex abuse in the church, you know, the, the, the code of silence, those, those productions show 
interview people from Buenos Aires who document how Fra uh, Francis, when he was the Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires, covered up all of their abuse. Now, covering up that abuse, he, so we know that he covered up abuse, but what uh, people do not know, uh, and, and that is if somebody is going to reveal something, uh, they, they have to be careful of the ramifications. And uh, one of the uh, aspects of my job in terms of being an investigative reporter involves talking with, with sources and people. And uh, uh, at this point, I, I still uh, uh, would, would not be, I would not write about this, but I can share it with you in, in that uh, I, I have had conversations with someone who said that he spoke with someone who attests to having been, you know, in Cordoba in Argentina when uh, Bergoglio was sexually involved with a seminarian. Wow. Now, because, but, but what made that a little more credible was the fact that the person was able to identify the time, the place, and even the former seminarian who he is alleged to have sodomized. Uh, so uh, if that's true, then you might understand too why uh, McCarrick was able to get around the way he did, because you see McCarrick, after Francis was elected, flew down to Buenos Aires with a priest from the seminary in, in Washington that he was living with. He was living in a, a Hispanic seminary there after he retired. And he went down to Argentina. And if, if in fact, if he uncovered that information that I was given about Francis in Cordoba, that might help explain why he was able then to do everything he wanted to and also why he was laicized because you see, canonically speaking, I don't know if you know this, most Catholics don't, but if a cardinal is, gets in serious trouble, right. only the Pope yeah. can preside at a trial of a cardinal. I now, did know that. Now, yeah. let's pretend, Joseph, that you're the Pope and I'm Cardinal McCarrick. Now, I know, if I know that you were doing, you were into, into seminarians in Cordoba, like I was in the seminarians in, in Newark, in New Jersey, then how, and if you know that I know <laughs> what you were into, how can you stand in judgment of me? Because if, if you try to stand in judgment of me in a trial, I'll say, well, who are you to tell me when you did the same thing in Cordoba? Right. So that's why you see, I believe McCarrick was laicized because once you're laicized then there's no trial. Do you avoid the trial? You just get rid of the guy. Right. So, so what I'm saying is uh, when you brought up the issue of, of Jesuits, you are right on. And, and two, uh, if you see who the Pope has surrounded himself with in the Casa Santa Marta in, in the Vatican, you'll find that a lot of those people that he's living with are known active homosexuals, like the person in charge of it, Monsignor Batista Rica, who, while he was in Uruguay, uh, was found to be living with Patrick, uh, uh, a, a, a Swiss man, who uh, he had a relationship with. Then later on, he was caught in an elevator with a gay prostitute. And then later on was beaten up in a gay park. Now, in park, yeah. this is the guy that the Pope has put in charge of his household. Yeah. So what does that say? It says a lot. <laughs> <laughs> the thing well, all I'm telling you, Joseph, is if you get invited to, to visit the Pope. I wouldn't go. Make sure, make sure you lock your door at night. <laughs> I wouldn't go. I wouldn't even go. Um, the, the thing that I found fascinating about you, you know, being um, published in America in 2001, because I've tried to wrap my head around, there's so much that's difficult when you're researching the Catholic Church. I don't know, it's very difficult. Like, say, with John J. McNeil, <clears throat> the famous uh, gay priest, he, he would later marry his partner, but I could never actually determine his status in the Jesuits was, was he, I couldn't figure it out. Was he still a Jesuit? I didn't know. It was very difficult. And I read a lot of sources. 
And then I, I found it, you know, fascinating that in 2001, you know, the, the Jesuits published you. And I, I, I'm thinking back because because I knew gay Jesuits and it wasn't their homosexuality and their behavior was certainly known among their fellow Jesuits. But I, I don't think it was it was wide, widely advertised. And I don't remember them being outspoken gay advocates. Certainly among their parishioners, they were known as being um, pro-gay or gay affirmative because I attended uh, same-sex weddings that were officiated by these men. But I mean, over the last 20 years, I mean, the Jesuits have become very public in their stance and support for, for gay causes. But, it, and it almost sort of mirrors the advancement that, it, I don't know if you wanna say advancement, but that the progression that it's made in the secular uh, society. I mean, within the last 20 years, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton were not pro-gay marriage. They weren't. So, I mean, their views <laughs> changed pretty pretty quickly. And then you have the Jesuits. I mean, I would say, you know, symbolized by James Mark being very, very pro-gay and publicly so, you know, advocating for everything except just of homosexual behavior, even gay marriage in the church. And I have the Germans jumping on board. And I wonder if that had a lot to do with Francis, because I think you made an interesting argument in this article too. I'm trying to tie this all together. Is that there was a meme, and I, 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 I don't think it was popular. Um, I don't think it's popular now. I don't know how any, anybody could make that claim. But certainly in Pope John Paul's um, papacy and in Benedict's is that this gay problem in the Catholic church, it's just going to be solved by sort of attrition that that was sort of, you know, the Paul the Six, you know, era priest, and they're dying off and, and they're leaving. But I don't, because you, you make the argument that it's going to actually increase. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It has and, I, to. and I think that's correct, because I think what I've seen in certain religious orders, and you talk about this in here, is that they do actively recruit among, among homosexuals. And this is interesting because a lot of these uh, gay affirmative religious orders, like the Paulists and the Jesuits, have these ministries and they actually recruit vocations from these ministries. And then you have just the problem in the diocese where, and you mentioned all of the, um, I don't know if you mentioned all of them, but you mentioned the uh, very pro-gay bishops who were connected with uh, McCarrick. We're talking about Wilton Gregory and uh, McElroy and Kupich. And I'd say certainly that the, the gay problem in the priesthood is going to get worse under them. It will. It, it, and that's why I maintain too uh, that the percentage of gays is higher. If you continue going up, the highest percentage are going to be in the cardinals, then the archbishops, then the bishops, then the priests, the seminarians, because I maintain that because look, pretend you're the, my bishop and you're gay, okay? And you know that I'm gay. And we're friends. You're going to make me your secretary. And then you're going to make me maybe your vicar general or put me in charge of your seminary. And then when it comes time to nominating people to become bishops, you're going to name me. Now, if, if I'm another priest that I'm straight and I'm really straight and I don't I don't buy this, you know, gay stuff, you know, because I, I, I see these guys like my classmates who were threats to my altar boys. And I think what they're doing, they, they should all be locked up. Well, <clears throat> if you're you're gay and you know that I have a strong stand in, in, in defense of these kids who are being abused that you're covering up for, uh, you're not going to make me anywhere. You're going to make keep me far, far away. So my point is, is that uh, gay bishops are making gay priest bishops and the gay bishops are, are being made gay archbishops by gay cardinals. 
and it just keeps going on and on and on. So, but but what's also happening because people like uh, Anthony Gorge and these other seminarians, former seminarians who I'm representing, <clears throat> when they uh, object to this, they're gotten rid of. And and you see, when you get rid of the straight guys, who are you left with? And, and, and that's why uh, I, I maintain that, no, the, the, not only will the percentage of, of gays in the priesthood and the episcopacy continue to increase, but at the same time, uh, anyone who's familiar with the difference in, in partnering of, of, between heterosexuals and homosexuals, knowing that, 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 that homosexual men are, have far more sex partners than heterosexual men will know then that you're, you're, you have to anticipate that by ordaining all of these homosexuals, you have to stand by for more and more of them, if, if, especially if 73% of them you know, have been known to come on to young men, you have to anticipate that you will continue to have some of these homosexual priests and bishops coming on to young men and, and vulnerable seminarians. Now, a lot of uh, um, gay affirmative priests and the LGBT Catholic activists would say, well, so what that a cardinal's gay? So what that a bishop is gay? So what that uh, priests are gay? That doesn't mean that they are going to be abusers because just like a heterosexual priest, they are uh, you know, committed to the vow of celibacy. So, so what that they're gay? That's what that's the argument that they would make. Um, what it's interesting is Richard Seif, the priest, and and I, I never got to talk to him. I wish I wish I would have, but um, he always made the argument that celibacy was the problem in the in the priesthood. And I and I've kind of gone back and forth with that in my head because um, these priests who do have a homosexual inclination and um, do act out, they're, they're not being celibate. And then that secretive nature of the vow of celibacy, and then you lay on top, oh, I don't wanna use that, that, uh, that, uh, that analogy. And then you put, you uh, layer on top of that, the admonitions against homosexuality in the Catholic Church that are, you are officially proclaimed. Then you've got two things that they have to be secretive about. So, I mean, what do you think about that? that the argument that they say it's it's not the issue of homosexuals in the priesthood, but it's this, it's celibacy. I personally believe, based upon all of my research, and remember, I talked with Richard Seif before he died. He was my neighbor here, 20 minutes away. I live in Coronado. <clears throat> he lived here in La Jolla, okay? Oh, beautiful. <laughs> and, and of course, as you know, you know, he's a good friend. He was a good friend of Tom Doyle, who also is a friend of mine. And so, <clears throat> you know, uh, we're, we're running in the same circles, okay? <clears throat> I believe both of those issues are correct. In other words, I believe there is a relationship between uh, uh, the the number of of, the, of homosexuals in the priesthood, which has led to predation, and that remember was confirmed too by uh, 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 Father uh, Paul Solins in his research at Catholic University, he showed very, very clearly, you know, how the, the number of, of, of cases of abuse rose as the percentage of gays in the priesthood increased. Okay? Uh, so, so I believe that's true. So I, 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 I discount those who say there is no relationship. Sec, but with regard to celibacy being the issue too, I, I, I agree with that insofar as uh, let's take the example of the Ukrainian Catholic Church. Okay, now as you know, the Ukrainians were uh, came back uh, after the Orthodoxy. You know, and they don't like the term unions, but they came back you know, uh, to join the Catholic Church. But and they were allowed on. The, they came back on the condition that they would not be forced to accept celibacy, which was introduced in the Roman Catholic Church after uh, the East and the West uh, divided. Right and now. So they always had a married clergy. But then you see, when they immigrated, when they started immigrating to the United States, uh, the American bishops, mainly who were of 
Irish background, got the Vatican to approve of, of a, nor, a, a decree basically saying that they were not allowed to practice their priesthood outside of their homeland if they're married. Oh, jeez. So, so what that meant was that, <clears throat> that, that the Ukrainian church and the Catholic church in the United States for years uh, uh, was basically made up of Eastern Rite priests who were forced, who were forced to accept celibacy. Now, if they wanted to marry, they could go back, you know, to the Ukraine or whatever. But but if they're in the United States, they had to accept that. Well, interestingly, what I found in my research now, I'm getting more and more cases in, involving Ukrainians in the United States who are homosexuals. But that is not true in Canada. You mm. see, Canada did not enforce that celibacy thing for them. So most of the priests. Ukrainian priests in Canada today are married. <clears throat> so when you, on the issue of celibacy, if in other words, the celibacy requirement for the Ukrainian priest has given rise to uh, uh, a number of the priests now in the United States who are Ukrainian being homosexuals and engaging in, 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 in sexual predation. That does not exist in Canada with the married priest. Now, you can understand that too when you go back to the minor seminaries, right? Minor seminaries, they had, they were being hit on by those priests, right? Who were on the faculty. But guess what? If you were in a high school and you went to a military academy, why weren't you hit on like that? Like, like all these uh, seminarians were? Well, because a lot of the faculty members on those military academies in high school were married. They had wives and kids. So they're not going to hit on these, on their cadets. You know, so so the bottom line is this. I really believe uh, that the problem is twofold. So it's not one or the other. It's both. It's both celibacy, and uh, you know, it, it's it's the relationship between homosexuality and ephebophilia. Yeah, and I, I that's fascinating. I agree with you. Um, and then the, the other argument they'll make is that well, the majority of sexual abusers are heterosexual men, but. Also, the majority of the population are heterosexual men. They, it's growing, but they do inflate the number of gay men. It's probably about 2% of, well, of the yeah, population. If they say the majority, yes, the majority of sex abuse victims in the United States are women. And right. so it, 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 they're, being, they're, being sexual, they're being raped and so forth by, by heterosexuals. Correct. Right. But not in the Catholic Church. Correct. Right. The majority uh, of the, the victims, again, are, are teenage males. Right. And, and that's, that, that is the very, very important distinction that even the John Jay study refused to, uh, to acknowledge the, the, the relationship between that and ephebophilia. Because yeah. yeah. in the John Jay study, uh, in some cases, voiced the same argument that Supich did by saying, well, there's no relationship between homosexuality and ephebophilia. So you have to understand, you have to, you have to discuss, you know, when they set this up, you have to be able to discuss this in an intelligent way and cut through, you know, what, what in many cases is a smoke screen. Yeah, you, you take apart large sections of the John Jay report and I appreciated that. I, I wanna get, and you, and you tackled this, this um, question in your writing and I, I kinda wanted to explore it a little more. What is the uh, incentive for let's say a gay a gay man to enter the priesthood and i think um before let's say i don't know what what date to put it um i don't know but let's say before the the sexual revolution in the 70s or, or uh, the declassification of homosexuality in 1973 from the dsm um i think there was a certain the incentive for a gay man to enter the priesthood um, what, it was a sort of cover, a sort of beard. I mean, what else were you going to do? I mean, in prior generations, people were, were expected to marry, you know, not that many people just had a career. So, uh, a, a young man from a Catholic family, if he had same sex attraction, never wanted to marry, he would enter the priesthood. Um, 
and it was a it was a way in which to be around other men, I guess, in a chase sort of way. And you kind of talk about that in in your paper, um, where you could be in an all male in, environment, and the question of your sexual orientation would sort of disappear. But now that that is no longer an issue, I mean, I know many many uh, men who are, I mean, me included many men who are raised Catholic and there isn't a stigma in the Catholic church at all to, around homosexuality. And um, I, I, I'm kind of not sure what the argument you make is. I think I kind of know which one I would make. What is the incentive now for let's say a homosexual man to enter the priesthood? I, I think it is, is it specifically in certain religious orders I think there's a possibility to be gay in, an, in, a form, in forms of your identity and to be open about it, but also to be sexually active with other priests. And it's also, you know, especially certain religious orders, the Jesuits, for example, it's a prestigious position. Um, my friend, John Jmirak, who I love from the stream, he made this argument that I'm kind of paraphrasing him, John, but he has such a great sense of humor. But he said, like, it draws gay men who were too dumb for the Democratic Party and too untalented for Broadway. So it's sort of a pool. And I have to say, I kind of agree with it because I met priests who were gay when I was actively gay. And uh, I don't know what place they would belong in the wider gay male community. They were sort of awkward. And so I could see that the, the priesthood is attractive because you know it's prestigious and you have ritual and, and ceremony and um, it's a place of, of honor that is a lot of times bequeathed, not because of accomplishment, just because of you're given it as, as a position by God, supposedly. Well, I think that uh, there's various motivations, okay? Uh, I would be very hesitant to identify just one because then I would be insulting others who don't have that uh, motivation. For example, I, I, uh, I'm involved in a case right now with a young man. I'm just a, talking about, I'm sorry, Gene, I'm just talking sure. about homosexuals. Right, I know, I know. Okay. This, this young man I'm, I'm dealing with is a homosexual, okay? okay. He was abused, okay? And, and, but he went into the gay life, but he didn't like it, you know? It was very dangerous and it wasn't fulfilling. And then he came back to the church, okay? Sounds and then like he me. And then Sounds he like decided me. he wanted to join an oratory. He wanted to be a priest, but he wanted to be, he wanted to be celibate. He did not want you know, to be sexually active, okay? Gene, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Should, yeah. should the church be accepting these people? I don't think they should. Um, not in terms of any theological point. I just think that they're open to grooming and abuse, more susceptible. Well, uh, and, and that was what actually happened to him, you see, because what he did was he, uh, when he revealed to his pastor, his Ukrainian pastor. No, 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 no. Yeah. And what, what happened? Oh, <laughs> so, but, but then he said, well, don't worry because the bishop also is gay too. <laughs> Run. So. Run so out it, of there. It, but, but you see, you see, when he reported this pastor coming on to him, they got rid of him. They got rid of him, you know. Uh, the, the seminarian. Yes, yes. They got of rid course. of him. Uh, and you see, so. so no I, brainer. Uh, what's, what's interesting is, you know, initially, a lot of the, the former seminarians I was dealing with were heterosexuals who were gotten rid of because the, the rector or whomever was afraid of being outed. So they got rid of him because they, uh, they got rid of the heterosexual. But. At the same time, too, because of the large number of homosexuals in seminaries, when they come on to a, a homosexual who turns them down, then they fear they have to get rid of this person, too, because that other person also may then, you know, report them. 
So uh, what I'm saying is, is that you have to distinguish in the seminaries today, people who are going there, there are some who are trying to, you know, uh, I mean, I, I dealt with one, he was, he was a, a real story, okay? He was abused when he was nine years old by his 15 year old brother who was abused by his uncle, okay? And he's a priest today, okay? The oh. one who was nine years old, okay? Who became a homosexual. But because he was abused by his own brother, okay? Uh, he is, 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 is it, he's involved in ministry in a particular state, a particular parish, but he is not at all, you know, abusive. I mean, for him to abuse someone would be like doing the same thing would happen to him. So he's the last person, you know, to want to abuse someone. But... Uh, so if he became a priest, you know, it was not because uh, he, wanted, he, he was a threat to others. But there are, unfortunately, others who are threats. And what's happened, because once they closed the minor seminaries, you had a large number of men who I were known, knew that they were homosexuals, were ag sexually active, but they wanted, you know, they saw the priesthood as a way to get some income, prestige. They could live in a closet. No one would know. <clears throat> and they could have boyfriends, too, among the clergy. Exactly. And, and this is where a lot of priests and bishops today, if you look at, at, at some of the bishops in the United States, you'll see that a certain number of them worked as you know music directors or all kinds of different things before they entered the seminary. So a lot of these guys who were who who were gay but who wanted to hide their you know orientation behavior became priests and then they were befriended by the bishops who were gay who then promoted them to become bishops so you you'll you'll find a number interestingly a number of bishops being made today who were uh delayed vocations and were were uh so, entered the priesthood basically as a way to live in the closet and to have a comfortable, you know, life well-financed. And uh, here's where we are today. So the problem is those uh, uh, homosexual bishops, however, even if they're not sexually active, okay, the problem is they're still discriminating against the straight guys. They're promoting the, the gay guys and so if you work in a, in a company, do you want to work in a company if you're a woman and, and all the, the guys are being promoted and you're smarter than they are? No. no. So that's why you see this problem is, is having a terrible impact upon the recruitment and the retention of healthy, holy, devout heterosexuals. I don't know why a, I don't know why a straight masculine guy nowadays would want to be a priest. I have no idea. But anyway, um, would you agree that the majority of homosexual, sexually active priests and bishops in the Catholic Church are not interested in minors? The majority are involved and only interested in adults. Yes, if especially uh, unless unless unless. They were groomed in minor seminaries. But because a lot of these guys now entered the priesthood after they all were, as adults, in other words, they didn't start off in minor seminaries or even college seminaries. Yeah. Because a lot of these guys now are were, identify themselves as gay and then enter the seminary, their sexual experience right. did not involve you know, teenage boys. Their sexual experiences were always involved with 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 adults. Adult, right? So they're going to be more, much more inclined to sleep with one another. That's why you had these orgies, like you had in Springfield in December of two thousand four. I read at that the in residence of, uh, of of Bishop. Uh, uh, um, I can't recall his name either. Um, I don't know the current Archbishop of Omaha. Oh, um, Lucas. Yes, George Lucas. So uh, <laughs> no relation to this. Yeah. So I mean that's I mean so you see if they were basically you know other you know gay priests in the diocese and even two of those were co-pastors. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, um, um, 
I'm I'm kind of I'm 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 not getting confused, but I, I, I people are listening are getting confused. I, I think there's kind of two different strains of thought going on here. One is that if you are sexually abused as a child, you could be more likely to sexually abuse as an adult. Yes. Um, or the not. Other, right. The other question is is that people who have been sexually abused as children, this is, this has been verified and I've, and with studies, and I think I, I wrote an article about it. People who are sexually abused as children are more likely to be sexually abused as adults. They're more likely to be repeatedly abused. Um, there's just two different, so I, that's why I'm worried about, I would be worried about anybody that was abused as a child, whether by a priest or anybody entering a seminary, my worry for them is that they are very likely to be re-abused. Uh, it, it, it's a real possibility. I, I've known people, priests, they're more, yeah, they're more likely right, who have who have been abused multiple times, and, and uh, uh, it, it's true. I mean, the, the but the problem is once that happens in your life. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, you know, you know how it affects your, your whole orientation, your, your whole, you, you, you're, you're affected by that. And it's very difficult if you've had this experience, if you were abused by a priest to enter into like a deep, loving, emotional relationship with a woman, you know, uh, because every time, you know, you, you, it, you, you're, you're thrown back. It's sort of like the woman who was abused by her father as a young girl. And then she gets married and then her husband wants to make love with her. And she immediately has these flashbacks to what her dad did so that their sexual relationship is very, very precarious. And it may be problematic to the point where they divorce. But if, if she can, it, it will only require therapy on her part. And then for her to reveal to her husband what happened to her, that then maybe they can come together. But for the most part, people who are who suffer sexual trauma, you know, as children, you know, that has a deep, profound effect upon them later on as adults. Or, or women, a number of women who are sexually abused as children often end up with abusive partners when they're adults. Well, they do. And yeah. That's why your point is well taken because you said. No, I'm I'm leading to something. <laughs> okay. Um, no, 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 no. But uh, I didn't mean I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I want to no, no. I, I, I want to uh, just real quick. Um, these are two studies. The impact of sexual abuse on sexual identity formation in gay men. This is from 2008. Emerging data suggests that as children, gay males have an increased risk for physical and sexual abuse. Anecdotal evidence suggests that a significant subset of children abused by clergy identify as gay as adults. Okay, here's another study. Um, this is um, comparative data of childhood and adolescent molestation in heterosexual and homosexual persons. 46% of homosexual men in contrast to 7% of heterosexual men reported homosexual molestation as children. So a number, so we're dealing with, with two facts here. A number of men who identify as gay were a, a, almost a majority were, were sexually abused as children. A large number of men who later identify as gay were victims of clergy abuse. So it's, it's conceivable that a large number of abuse victims are drawn to the priesthood. Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, um, uh, there, there's a, a case involving a, a, a former seminarian, <coughs> excuse me, Bless from you. the North North American College, who was abused. He entered the seminary, but then he his his abuse affected his orientation, and so when he was assigned to a parish, his sexual orientation caused him then to enter into a relationship with a man. Mm -hmm. He married that man. You know, once it, uh, the, 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 it was passed in the United States, you could marry. So he married the man. And interestingly, you're, you'll find this interesting. He went to his bishop. He went to his bishop and he said, Bishop, 
I got to tell you, look, I'm a homosexual. I had this happen to me by this priest in the diocese. He abused me. Then I was ordained. And now I got married. You know what the bishop said to him? No. The bishop said to him, congratulations. I'm glad. Are you happy? But keep that quiet. Don't, don't let the people know. But then, then he came back to the bishop later on and said, oh, bishop, uh, by the way, I want to bring suit against the priest in the diocese who abused me. And what did the bishop do? <laughs> oh, we have to send you away for psychological evaluation. You have problems because you see, uh, it, it was okay for him to marry this man and, and live a double life. You know, to be the pastor of this Catholic church and have this gay, you know, married man on the side. But don't report abuse. Don't say that this priest abused you. So in the end, what happened to him, he left the priesthood. He married the man, and now he lives in Canada. But, but the thing is, is that uh, it, it, it's inconceivable almost how, you know, these bishops, you know, uh, cover up all of this abuse and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and those who are sexually active. They know they're sexually active, uh, but then they, they still cover up for them. Mm. Um, these, these two studies that I mentioned um, just a couple of minutes ago, um, I'm going to assume that, you know, those children for a large part, especially those who were abused by clergy were groomed. Now you make a point in your article that a, the target group, um, and I've talked about this too, the target group for a number of predator priests has shifted from minor boys to seminarians. Yes. And I, I've, I've, I've have noticed this as well, just anecdotally to people that I've talked with. And what, what I thought was profound about your writing here is that, because I'm looking at the psychology of, of priests, Catholic priests, and their willingness to accept abuse. And what I mean by abuse is I've talked to a number of priests who, and I haven't talked to any priests recently who are happy with their superiors or their bishops. They all believe, you know, that their superior bishop would throw them under the bus immediately. That um, their bishops don't support them. And oftentimes their bishops are abusive towards them. And what I mean by abusive is um, it's kind of, and you talk about gaslighting in the article. It's like having an abusive father or neglectful father. The father just doesn't care. He's um, self-centered. He's mainly concerned about himself. He doesn't support you. He doesn't um, affirm what you're doing. It, it just, it goes on and on. And I, and I, even to the point where priests are told to be quiet, you know, God forbid if, if a priest ever raises any issue in his own diocese about fellow priests or anything that's that's going on. Bishops don't want to hear anything. They don't want a problem. You know, they want everything to kind of stay at the parish level. When I talk to priests who have such a dysfunctional relationship with their bishop and are fearful of their bishop, because specifically I'm talking about the ones who have seen certain abuses and have talked about or have talked to their bishop about it, um, you know, they know that their vocation, you know, is, is hanging by a string. And the bishop can, number one, uh, you know, make an accusation against them, can uh, remove them from the priesthood, take away their faculties, lay aside them. So there's this fearful sort of terrorized relationship with their bishop. And I was kind of like, where does this come from? And why? Because I, I told bishop, priests that I like, I said, Father, leave, leave. I, I couldn't put up with this. It's very, um, it's not good for your mental health. 
And I think that's why a lot of priests have, have psychological problems. But I was trying to figure out why they're this way, why they submit themselves to abuse in this abusive relationship with their bishop and with their pre with with the church and with the superior. And I, I, I can answer that. Okay, I kind of think I'm sorry. I'm sorry to take up so much time. Sure. I I kind of think it has to do with abuse in the seminary that it started there, that this grooming process and gaslighting, and it it starts in the seminary because you talked about this and with I think it was the, with the Gorgia case, but you talked about it in several instances where seminarians were scared because they thought they were going to lose their vocation. So it's that fear is instilled in priests in the seminary. Sorry to be so verbose. Well, they, they, uh, they are afraid. And, and the perfect case study for that involves uh, R Richard Biernat from yes. Buffalo. I know. Yes. Remember when, when he when 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 Art's father Art Smith came on to him and he reported to Bishop Grosch, uh, Grosch again threatened to send him back to Poland if he spoke about the abuse that he experienced from Art Smith, who was Grosch's classmate in the seminary. So Bierna thought if he kept quiet, he could be ordained and he, he, he could just get on with his life and not have to worry about this. Well, of course, uh, he was ordained, but then, then he, he, uh, because he was young and good looking and handsome, Malone made him his secretary, you know? And, and then when, when, of course, when he, when Bierna saw that Malone's covering up all this abuse, just like he covered up his abuse from Father Art Smith, then he went to the media and then blew it up. And then Malone's relieved. But then the last thing that Malone does is he's walking out the door as he suspends uh, Bierna. So these priests, you know, you're right. It, it, it starts, they're in the seminary, they're, but they think that they can make it through. But even then, they're kind of naive to believe that even if they're ordained, it's not necessarily going to stop there. They're still going to be at risk. But you see, a lot of them... Uh, keep quiet because remember priests uh, don't have a lot of financial security you know in other words if they get rid of you uh, unless you or, or someone like for example like father James Altman who was a lawyer before he became a priest right <laughs> you, know, yeah. you don't have you don't have you don't have a job to fall back on right you know you don't have you don't have a net to catch you so and, and your, your pay is meager. So what do you do with a degree in philosophy or in theology? That, and, and, and we'll, 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 you'll be lucky to get a job, you know, flipping burgers at a McDonald's with those degrees, right? So, so it's because the priests are basically kept poor uh, that they, they, they're threatened because you see, uh, if, if I didn't have my military retirement, you know, I probably would have ended up going off to that prison in the middle of nowhere because I felt, well, hold it. Otherwise, I'm going to be living on the street. And what do I do with my theology degree? But only because I had a military retirement, I didn't have to be poor. I didn't have to live in the street. I, I felt, look, I'm not going to do that. You know, so I'm going to do something else with my life. So most of those priests today uh, are out there if, if, they, uh, if they're abused by their bishops or passed over because of somebody else or this or that. A lot of them will stay because they don't feel uh, they have other alternatives. I, I have priests who bishops have gotten rid of who are now working in grocery stores, who are driving trucks and doing all these things just to, just to survive. There is also beyond, I think more important than the economic, what you say, I, 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 I believe you, it's true. Um, I think beyond the economic ramifications of them like speaking up and being kicked out of the seminary is the spiritual because these young men are committed to being priests. I mean, in this day and age, just to enter a seminary, you, I mean, you, especially the ones that become like so much so-called troublemakers or, or whistleblowers, they, they believe God has called them. This is what they're Absolutely, like to. Anthony Gorgia. Yeah, yes, he's a perfect example. What a brave young young man. 
they believe that they're called by God. I mean, that's a massive responsibility if, if you believe that. So they, that's used against them because you use, you said this in one of the, talking about one of the seminaries, they were terrified, terrified of being dismissed from the seminary. I don't think they're terrified because they're not going to have a job. They're terrified because they believe God has called them to do this and they have to do it. So I think when you have that sort of, um, when you have that belief, you're willing to put up with a lot of abuse. Right. I, I think particularly, <clears throat> and that's not when healthy. you're dealing with, see, you have to distinguish, I think, <clears throat> you see, when a seminarian is, is gotten rid of like Gorgia, he wasn't so much terrified because of financial, because I mean, the, the uh, he has, he's still young. He's still, got, he could still be a doctor, a lawyer, a professor, whatever. But, but you see, if you're a 50 year old priest or a 60 year old priest, if you're someone like Paul Kalchik, you know, or, or Mark White or these other good priests, you yeah, know, yeah. who uh, are, are being gotten rid of and, and being sidelined and being canceled, uh, you know, as Mel Gibson, you know, referred to them as, you know, uh, <clears throat> Then for them, uh, again, unless they have a prior experience, uh, they may may have some financial problems uh, that are going to be more threatening at their age where they can't get a, a job as opposed to a young seminarian who gets out maybe if he's still in his 20s. Yeah, I think a, a seminarian would be fearful to speak up about any kind of abuse mental physical spiritual whatever yeah because they feel that that they're being called by god but i think a, a priest who's already been ordained especially a middle-aged one like 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 you described i think there's a spiritual aspect too is that so much of their identity is the priesthood i mean they're a priest their father joe or whoever what do you do after that and i can relate to that headspace because I remember I was only 30 when I, or 29, when I left the gay community and so much of my identity was, was enmeshed with that. So I didn't know how I could leave because then you kind of wonder who you are, what you did. And I can't imagine a priest putting everything on the line like that, like the good priest that you've talked about, because so much of who they are and who people see them as is, is the priesthood. Right. Well, well, you it, would know about what sure. well, I, about. I think you, you could only take so much. You see, <laughs> you, you, uh, you could only push a person so far. Right. Uh, and, 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 and you see what happens is when, when you're, you're someone like Father Altman or, or Father Mark White uh, and, uh, and Father Paul Kalchik, these priests are being suspended unjustly. No grounds. You know, all these things invented. And then remember, in the case of Father Paul Kalchik, what most Catholics in the United States don't know about Father Kalchik is that when Father Kalchik appealed his dismissal by Supic to Rome, because remember, Kalchik was abused twice. Yeah. Okay? When, Kal when Kalchik appealed, uh, this was like one in a million cases where the, the Vatican said, okay, he should be restored to the parish. He was unjustly, you know, because remember, uh, Supic said that, that he uh, disobeyed him by allowing his parishioners to burn that gay banner that the previous homosexual pastor had hanging in the church. Well, <clears throat> as you know, what Father Kalchik allowed his parishioners to do is in keeping with the teachings of the Catholic Church. If you have a blessed object like a rosary or a holy card, you're not to dispose of it by throwing the garbage. You're either to bury it or burn, burn it. it. Exactly. Well, that's what they did. So what Father Kalchik allowed his parishioners to do was in total keeping with the teachings of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. But he still got, they still got rid of, you know, Supid still, you know, got rid of him. So uh, these, uh, these priests who are being canceled, like Kalchik, uh, then, uh, in, again, in his case, when the Vatican said he should be restored, you know what Supic did? No. He called him in and says, look, because Supic knew that the Vatican ruled against him and said he should put him back in that parish, right? What did Supic do? 
He says, I just decided to close the parish. No. And so he'll sell the parish, get the money from that to use it to pay for more abuse victims. Snake. What an absolute snake. But most priests, if they had a sticky situation like that, they would handle it in the way that is the least likely to draw attention from anybody, namely anybody at the chancery. Priests just know that they don't want to call. If you get a call from a bishop, it sucks. You just don't want it. You just don't want it. Because I've talked with priests that I know that know that these that certain abuses are taking place. And I'm like, Father, can't you just speak out? And they're like, no, I can't. And because I will lose my priesthood. And sure. I was like, and I was like, well, is that such a bad thing? And and the way they rationalize it in their head, and I, and I get it, is they say, I'm a good priest, and they are. And they say, I'm doing all of these good things for people. I've helped these people and I brought them closer to God. Am I going to give all that up to make this stand? And they're kind of like, no, I'm not. I'll shut up. That's exactly what happened to Monsignor Philip Saylor in my own diocese. When he testified at an abuse trial <clears throat> and his, his honest testimony uh, resulted in the diocese being losing the case because he told the, the truth about when the bishop really knew that, uh, that Father Luddy was was abusing young men. The new bishop, at that point, uh, Bishop Hogan was already retired during, when that trial took place. But the new bishop, Bishop Adamitz, because the diocese lost over a million dollars in that trial, said to Monsignor Saylor, who was stationed at that point at the most prestigious parish in the diocese, because he was very respected Monsignor, uh, he, Bishop Adamitz sent him out to a, a church in the middle of nowhere, and basically issued him what is called a precept of silence. He said that if Monsignor Saylor were to write or to speak about that trial, he would be he would lose his retirement and would be suspended from the priesthood. Monsignor Saylor went off there, but then re retired early, you know, uh, because he could not take you know working for this pervert bishop. So when the bishop, when the Pennsylvania grand jury met. And, and Adamitz was called before the grand jury to test to, and asked about all the abuse that he was covering up. Uh, all he did was take the Fifth Amendment. So in the end, uh, Adamitz died in, in disgrace. Uh, Father Monsignor Saylor lived to outlive outlived him and just recently died at the age of 91. Yeah, I would say the percentage of especially diocesan priests who who have knowledge, uh, and, and I don't mean just abuses of like another priest being rude or a jerk, but have, have real knowledge of abuse, of financial, um, sexual, um, emotional, um, you know, psychological abuse taking place, spiritual abuse. I would say it's close to 100% that don't say anything because they're fearful. Oh, I believe so. <laughs> they're, they're, they're afraid. And because we see, you know, where, where uh, uh, the bishops and, and even the Pope you know, are, uh, are vindictive. And, yeah. uh, and, and so they, uh, they know how the game is played. And uh, they, they, uh, they see how other people have been treated. And uh, uh, they know if, if they speak out, they're going to be treated the same way. You, you wrote in this study, um, and I think all of this, this fear and this, this gaslighting starts in the seminaries, you wrote, some seminarians caved into pressure from seminary or church officials not to report sexual misconduct in exchange for ordination. That's exactly, again, what happened in the case of Biernat. Now, that's exactly what happened in the case of another seminarian from Baltimore, who was, uh, was drugged and sodomized. And when he reported the sodomy, uh, the, the uh, archbishop, who was Keeler at the time, uh, appointed an investigator who was an abusive priest himself, who said, Father, or said to the young man, look, if you keep quiet, we'll ordain you to the diaconate. Right. Well, he was ordained to the diaconate, 
But then when they found out that he shared what happened to him with a friend who worked at the Polish embassy, they feared that they might be prosecuted for covering up abuse. So they got rid of him and gave him a one-way ticket back to Poland. You're right here. Um, seminarians are not provided any particular protections under the Catholic Church's Code of Canon Law and as such are entirely dependent upon their bishops and seminary superiors for advancement to ordination. Exactly. And that's what happens in all of these cases that I'm dealing with now with Gorgia, with that priest, with that uh, seminarian who was sodomized, with the seminarian who was approached up in, in, in uh, Rhode Island, uh, the other one who was approached in Baltimore. I mean, there's so many in Buffalo. I can give you case after case after case to support that position. That's messed up. That's just so messed up because I remember I, I lived in LA for a little while and this is post my conversion. And I met, I met a guy who he, he had some friends. He was very involved in the Catholic church. And I was too, but he knew some guys at St. John's seminary in Camarillo. And he was like, Oh, Joe, you know, I'm going to go for a day. Uh, you know, I think they're, I, I don't know what the deal was but we were gonna be visitors for the day. I think he was thinking about entering the, the, the seminary. And I talked to one seminarian and he said that, cause I, at that time I was pretty, I was pretty red-pilled and I was like, you know, what's it like here? I knew that that place was a den of vipers. And he was like, well, one of the this, this, this spiritual directors who was a priest there at the seminary asked him about his sexual fantasies in their discussions. And I was like, no, no, that's sick. I, I don't, what's the reason that he's asking you about your sexual fantasies? And it's like, well, if you want to be, and a lot of them called themselves submariners and they were like, <laughs> well, we're below the surface, you know, we're conservative and we know this is bunk, but after ordination, you know, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna change the church. We're gonna reform the church. God bless these guys. You know, they were young and, and idealistic. But I was like, this, you have to put up with this in order to become a priest. This is sick. Well, and, 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 and that's, that's the sad part because uh, they feel, and I really feel particularly for the younger seminarians, not, not the delayed vocations who are in their 30s and 40s, I, I'm, I'm really concerned for the straight young ones because they, in today's environment, uh, will not be able to have any of the mentoring experiences and so forth that I had. So, you know, going back to psychology 101, we all have a basic human need to love and to be loved. But that that basic need for a lot of young priests today, I think, is going to be very hard to to realize especially when 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 all the problems that were caused by the gay priest which have put in all these barriers to uh, uh between them and young people uh they won't won't have the mentoring experiences that i had which were very fulfilling you know and uh i, I think psychologically that's that's going to be a uh, a challenge for them i i think then if they let's say if they meet a young woman who they're attracted to or is maybe attracted to them with the possibility of getting married, having a family is going to be a greater temptation for them under those circumstances. I, I wanted to show you something. I've, I've kept you too long. I wanted to show you something real quick. I read, actually read the McCarrick report from the, Vat the Vatican. I'm absolutely crazy. So I think it was like 400 odd pages. And there was one page that I keep going back to. I think it was page 75 because even they couldn't, make this smell good they just couldn't um let's see so okay this is page 73 right. from the the mccarrick report <laughs> let me see if i can blow it up a little bit here um okay uh shortly after his return to metuchen priest four went to see monsignor <laughs> gambino to tell him what mccarrick had done to him this is a priest who had been sexually abused by Carl okay. McCarrick. Expecting to receive support, priest four recalled Gambino's reaction. I explained what had happened to me. And according 
to the way he handled it, he treated me like I was somehow at fault for making an accusation. Mm -hmm. Gambino admonished Priest for that he was making serious accusations against the bishop and that he needed to go to counseling or else he may not be ordained. There we go. You can't be ordained if, if you're not, you know, part of the boys club. Sure. Monsignor Gambino arranged for Priest Four to meet with Father Edward Zogby, SJ, a counselor who is affiliated with Fordham University. After the counseling, which also involved taking Priest Four's confession, Father Zogby wanted to give Priest Four a hug and then tried to kiss him and grabbed his crotch. Yeah. That's the way it works. Well, you know, what was interesting about the whole McCarrick report that uh, I would say 99% of the Catholics failed to understand was that, you know, the McCarrick report was prompted by uh, Archbishop Vigano's accusation that Pope Francis had been covering up for McCarrick. Now, remember, Vigano was never attacking McCarrick. All that was documented. He knew, you know, but the, the real question, the, the real point was that was Francis covering this up? So, so what, what Francis did was he, he turned it around. He tried to make the report about, and he called it the McCarrick report. What well, really was supposed to be, you know, the Bergoglio Pope Francis report, because he was the one who really was uh, 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 accused. And so when, when Francis got his attorney, you know, from California to write up this report, his defense attorney, as you know, if you're my defense attorney and you know that I'm guilty, you can't say anything, you know, because you'll be disbarred. So from the very beginning, the fact that, that Francis commissioned the investigation of himself got his own attorney who works for the Vatican to do this study and then to write it up. It was a for, I mean, it was a waste of time. I mean, it would be like uh, Bill Clinton having his lawyer investigate accusations that he was carrying on an affair with a White House intern. You know? So, I mean, the, the, the whole, the McCarrick report was not supposed to be about McCarrick. It was supposed to be about Francis. So even remember Richard Sype when he turned in all that information to Bishop McElroy, you know, years earlier, the same information that he gave to Benedict that caused Benedict to sideline him, what did McElroy do? You know, and remember, he, McElroy was legally served the material. So we, we know that he got it. Well, of course, Francis covered that up. McElroy covered it up and, and nothing happened. So, uh, no, it, it, it's that the McCarrick report was a joke from the very, very beginning. It, it was, you know, it was an absolute joke. McElroy and is the is the bishop in, in San Diego. And he's also I've written about him because he's also a big pro LGBT advocate. And he's also a big supporter of James Martin. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and that's why uh, you know, I, I would never you know, apply for faculties here because yeah. I could never, you know, I would have, and, and they don't want me to apply for faculties here because uh, uh, they know they don't want a whistleblower, you know. Uh, they don't, they don't want a, a man with a conscience and with, uh, with fortitude. You, you know what I'm, what I'm going towards. You, you, they don't want a man. They, they want sheep. They want scared priests. That's what they want. Yeah. And that's what they have. And that's exactly what they have. And, and unfortunately, the, the Catholics, uh, because they're under this leadership, you know, they, uh, they're really being misled. I mean, they, uh, in other words, if, uh, if you have a, a, a priest and a bishop who uh, sees no, nothing wrong with giving communion to someone like Biden, who promotes abortion, uh, and married a same-sex couple. Right. And, and we, so we have a, a number of different issues there. But remember, too, uh, it, it, when it comes to that issue, you know, I'm very, very pro-life. Why? Because same thing with the altar boys. I, 
you know, I, I have I, I would value, you know, why having a wife and children and, and 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 not want somebody to harm them. Well, again, if I never had that desire, I may be less inclined to be so pro-life. I'm not saying that a person can't be pro-life if they're they're homosexuals, but I'm just saying that in some cases it interferes with that 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 you know psychological need to procreate. And that so I, I think that's why a lot of the members of the gay community are want to propagate their message through the you know as it's their way of propagating you know in other words the whole pro lgbtq thing is their way of, of, of creating more people like themselves when they don't when they don't want to uh, have children and families of their own that way yeah. it's another form of procreation yeah yeah i would i would i I'm, i wonder just i'm, I'm going to try to wind down here I would wonder if, if you agree with this. I think that, um, I would say the majority of priests, if they weren't abused as children, they'd be, they're abused in the seminary. So I would say um, the majority of Catholic priests have, have experienced abuse. And I never really defined or unpacked the term abuse because I, I think a lot of it means people think physical or sexual abuse, but there's psychological abuse. And you talked about that in your report in terms of right. gaslighting. And um, I mean, I was gaslit. I, when I, you know, when my story is kind of weird, I sent you my book, is that um, when I got out of the gay community and I'd been involved in pornography, it's kind of like, well, what do you do? So I went and worked for these traditional TLM Latin mass priests in Pennsylvania. And, I, you know, I thought I was really psychologically damaged and they knew my past and, and they invited me back there to live with them and, and work with them. And right away, I started seeing problems that I thought were abusive, grooming, um, predation. And I went to one of the priests who I wasn't aware that he was actually involved in predation. And I said, you know, I'm seeing father so-and-so do this. And it's, it's got me concerned. And he knew my past. He knew all my past. And he said, well, Joe, um, you know, you were abused by priests and you experienced this in the gay male community and abuse. So you're seeing this. You're like transferring this <laughs> on to other people. You see how they use it against you? And, oh, I, yes. and I believed it. And I was like, you know what? I, I, and I slowly, I started going crazy because I kept seeing this stuff and I'm like, I'm not really seeing it. It's, it's my mind. I'm seeing things. I'm making it look that way. And as it turned out, I was seeing exactly what I was seeing. Well, so they said the same thing to you. They said to me, when I reported father, John Matt Lee to Archbishop O'Brien saying that, look, he has a problem. He has a living boyfriend. This guy needs help. I mean, he's, I'm worried about the sailors he's ministering to. Well, uh, what does uh, what does O'Brien say to me, Gene? Are you homophobic? See a priest. A now, music. now, now, what happened five years later? What happened five years later? You know, when 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 John, Father John Matthew Lee was arrested and charged with uh, conduct on becoming an officer, sodomy, aggravated assault, and failure to inform sex partners that he was HIV positive. What does O'Brien say when he's addressed by the uh, by the media? She says, "I had no idea." Oh, of course, that he they always say that. You know, but he was willing to send me off to the a nut house, you know, because you know I reported him. In other words, I was the problem for reporting the abuse that he was well aware of, and that he himself probably engaged in himself at different times in his life. Well, uh, it, it's I, I pity. Uh, so many of these priests who have to work for uh, some of these people who uh, are really just living in the closet, enjoying the the, the good life, and uh, uh, lying, <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's it's really sad. Uh, I, I really pity uh, a lot of these priests. I want to talk real quick at the end of our conversation. I could talk to you all day. This is an open letter to Catholic media complicit in the cover up of sexual abuse. I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to, wow, because I read this and I was like, dang, you don't, you don't, you know, you don't pull any punches. You wrote the, because I've had this, 
I've had this beef for a long time because this issue that I've tried to raise, try to get the mainstream Catholic media to cover it, forget it. Because then they'll lose, they're, they're, they're kind of in the same sort of position that seminarians and priests are in. They're afraid. They're afraid that they're going to, I mean, the, the priests and seminarians. they're benefactors. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. The, the seminarians are afraid they won't be ordained. The priests are afraid they're going to be laicized. And the mainstream Catholic media afraid they're going to lose access. So they shut up. It's this toxic environment. You wrote, the Lord has given journalists the mandate of reporting the truth. But Catholic media outlets squander this gift every time they cover up the behavior of countless accused priests and bishops by whitewashing the face of the vocation crisis. I'm writing to request that you abstain from receiving the Eucharist until you confess and receive absolution for deceiving Catholic readers and endangering vulnerable seminarians. Wow. <laughs> oh. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Yeah. I was gonna, I was gonna sign that uh, Monsignor, you know, Eugene Thomas Gamolka, STL, but I, I, I uh, because I never asked to be made a Monsignor. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, and I always, even when they made me a Monsignor, I still would tell people, don't call me Monsignor. I like the title Father better. It's, it's much more paternal, much more scriptural. But uh, when I wrote that, <laughs> that piece to the, uh, to the journalists and the editors, I was, I was almost tempted, I was tempted to, uh, to use my uh, uh, canonical Monsignor title there. It, that that is one of the reasons why I mean I left the Catholic Church um, because I tried for 20 years to try to help reform the church from the inside and I finally realized that it's impossible. Well, it, it's it's uh, it's it's even more difficult now, you know, under the. Uh, the, the Francis pontificate because it's only getting worse and uh, uh, it's hard. I, I, I pity bishops like uh, Strickland, you know, and, and others who are, are, are trying to do the right thing. And then when they hear people, you know, like uh, Cardinal Marx in Germany, you know, saying that the catechism is all screwed up and, and, and really uh, uh, it needs to get, get with it today and, and, and accept homosexual behavior. Well, uh, how does how does that you know? I can only imagine how that affects people, good people, good bishops like Strickland. It, it is not a serious religion. Well, yeah, and and and, and it, it's 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 if you look statistically too, if you'll note in my report, I noted how the how so how the church attendance has been has been affected, you know, by this whole crisis. Uh, which continues to, 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 to go on, unlike people who want to say that it's all over. But, you know, remember, the largest denomination in the United States today is the Roman Catholic Church. The second largest denomination in the United States are people who were baptized Catholics and fallen away. The third largest denomination, which is the largest Protestant denomination, in the United States or the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, there are 30 million fallen away Catholics, former Catholics. There are 15 million Southern Baptists. So the, the fallen away Catholics make up twice the number of the largest Protestant denomination. What does that tell you? Now, if you were the, the, the CEO of McDonald's Corporation, and if you look at how many churches are closing year after year, week after week, if, 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 if you, uh, if, if let's say 40% of all of your McDonald's throughout the world are closing now, I dare say that you might be removed from office. But, but the bishops, they, get, get, they gather in, in Washington. Why is it that they never really address seriously all the church closures, the, the, the drastic decline in vocations, you know, and, 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 and why is that never discussed? Why? Because they know the problem and the problem is them. Exactly. They are and, the problem. Yeah, and those, and those, I think those numbers are kind of a mirage because what the bishops have done is they've imported new Catholics because they've abused 
sure. the, 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 the people here in the United States. So they bring in new people to abuse and eventually they'll get tired and they'll leave too. And then I don't know where they're going to get the next group because um, uh, Catholicism is cratering in Latin America too. They just, they just uh, did a study. It's, it's uh, the largest Catholic country in the world. Brazil is about to become not the largest Catholic country in the world. It's not right. going to be predominantly Catholic anymore. Well, uh, it, 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 it's, it's, <laughs> it's inevitable I'm when not you a... consider uh, what, 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 what's going on. And, and so the problem, the real problem is, is that when you have people who don't really have supernatural faith, who are in this for all the, not the right reasons. And when you have the good people who really feel called by God, you know, to follow, you know, in, in, in Christ's footsteps, you know, when these are the people who are being gotten rid of and sidelined and being canceled, uh, it doesn't make for a very good future in my mind for the Catholic church. The leadership in the church is also middling. They're not, they're not anything extraordinary. I, I, I've always said that in the real world, they wouldn't make it the leadership because I've talked to priests a lot about being, well, you would know this too, because this, you knew it. Yeah. I mean, you talk about being in the seminary with future bishops, princes of the church, you know, and I've talked to priests and I was like, I was in the seminary with Bishop so-and-so, and we all knew, we all knew that they were going to rise up the altar. They were picked out and groomed very early on. And I was trying to figure out what, and I've talked to some of these priests, what it was, they were very obedient. Well, and, and they're very good at cover-up. Remember in 1985, <laughs> when Father Tom Doyle published his report on sex abuse in the United States, that was covered up by the Vatican and all the US bishops. He was shown the door of the Vatican embassy, but the two priests that replaced him one after another, who sat at the same desk, received all the abuse reports that he was receiving, but instead of reporting them, they covered them up, were none other than Timothy Dolan and Blaise Supich. So Tom Doyle's report for being honest and reporting the abuse and, and trying to get the bishops to do something to avert it, you know, is thrown out. The, 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 the priests who covered it all up are cardinals today in Chicago and New York. Yep. And I've, and I've written to Dolan several times, and this was years ago, because I was trying to figure out, okay, I've got a blatant example of insanity. So there's a, there's a priest with faculties incarnated in the diocese, and he gave a lecture that said, um, well, he, he talked about how heterosexual men are not open to receiving God. They're, they're more standoffish. They're not receptive, he said. And he said, well, gay men are more receptive to um, um, God and the Holy Spirit sexually as well. And so I sent him the DVD of never responded. And he's done nothing to with this priest and he's done nothing to clamp on, down on any of this stuff going on in his diocese. Well, and, and that's what what I learned very, very quickly, too, in, in the Gorgia case. I mean, this goes back to very, his very, very first assignment. After he was ordained, a priest and was assigned to a parish in St. Louis, where he uh, was stationed with Father Valentine, who was sexually abusing Dennis O'Leary. And, 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 uh, and Dolan saw O'Leary uh, being brought many times to uh, Valentine's room. <laughs> You know, and did nothing. And so and then years later, when uh, again, when uh, Regali, uh, Cardinal Regali made uh, uh, a dole in his auxiliary bishop and put him in charge of abuse, when O'Leary now, years later, now he's in the 30s, goes to, to uh, 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 Dolan and says, well, look, what are you going to do about, you know, how I was abused after all these by about Father Valentine? And, and of course, Dolan, who's appointed there to cover it all up, says, oh, Tim, uh, I don't know, Father Valentine was a great priest. So, again, the bottom line is, is that uh, these uh, victims are, 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 are treated, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're it, it's just sad. It's, it's very, it, it, you can't, and then you understand why all the people are leaving the church. Yeah. You know? And the way that they treat, 
sex abuse victims is the way they treat seminarians and priests. It's the same exact way. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and me being and me being so naive for years, I've gone to these bishops with my hat in my hand <laughs> and just like, you know, please help. And I've gone with evidence, I've gone with pictures, I've gone with video, you know, everything. And I said, and they don't care. They just no, don't, they don't care. But again, you know, they don't <clears throat> They, I don't know if they've ever had, you know, those feelings that I told you that I had as a young priest towards young people, and if they don't have that, <clears throat> then then they they can't feel, you know, uh, how evil it is, you know, to treat people this way, and uh, they they because they they wrestle with these problems themselves, and some of them, like as I said, if 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 the Pope really did, if the Pope really did sodomize that seminarian in Cordoba, why would we be surprised that he then later on covered for Grassi <clears throat> to try to get his 15 year sentence overturned? Or why did he hide Z uh, Zanchetta, who was just you know, convicted uh, of abusing those two seminarians uh, you know, in, uh, in his seminary? You know, because he did the same thing. Only the difference was he didn't get caught, they did. But why, why Joseph, has Francis, unlike John Paul II and Benedict, not returned to his native Argentina after all of these years. Why? Because he's afraid of being knocked off the death threats. Because after all those people, in other words, if you covered up all this abuse, let's say if you're the Pope, okay, and you covered up the abuse of my kid brother or kid sister, okay, and they went appealed to you to use, and you did nothing about it. And now I'm dying of cancer, and you're coming back to my native land. What am I going to do? I'm going to go out and get a rifle. And I'm going to learn how to be a sniper, and I'm going to take you out because my brother or my sister, their lives are screwed up now. One may have committed suicide. One may be on drugs. The other one may be addicted to alcohol. Their lives were destroyed by the abuse that you tolerated. So that's why Francis has not gone back to Argentina. Yeah. Well, one last thing, I, I promise. You, you included that famous quote from um, Archbishop Fulton Sheen about the laity reforming the church and not, not the clergy. Um, what made me pessimistic about that is I see the same kind of gaslighting and I, I know social media is weird, but it's a lot, it's the way a lot of people communicate. And when I've tried to um, expose some sort of abuse in the church, the pushback is from the laity a lot. And I can see where they've been gaslit. And um, they use the same old stuff. Don't betray Jesus for, because of Judas. Where will you go? You can't leave the church. You know, it's 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 all this cult mentality that if you leave, you're abandoning God. And I can imagine that that plays that kind of plays in the head of same seminarians is, is like they're in these abusive seminaries and they're like, oh, my gosh, I can't leave. I can't abandon God. And this is the same argument that the laity uses against people. So that sort of abusive gaslighting BS has trickled all the way down to the laity. And I'm like, this is not good. Well, see, that's exactly what happened to the Gorgia family. You know, here they gave their son, their only son, their only son, Maria had two miscarriages oh. and, she, and she had a difficult uh, birth with, with Anthony, okay? And so you're a good Italian family. You want grandchildren, right? Bambini, allora, magari, io voglio avere molto famiglia, una grande famiglia. But when their son Antonio said when he was six years old, Mama, Papa, io voglio diventare un sacerdote. I want to be a priest. You know, being good Catholics, they said, okay, we'll support you. And then when all this happened to them, all these people that they, in their parish of Our Lady Star of the Sea, that they welcomed into their homes, that, you know, abandoned them. The same thing happened to a family in Baltimore whose son was abused at John Paul II Seminary and then later on at St. Mary's in Baltimore. 
The same thing. The, these, these parents were very involved in the church, in the, the lay orders and so forth. And then when their son reported the abuse, you know, and they brought it to the attention, oh, no, the, everybody ran away. You know, and, and so, no, I can I can see, you know, this is why it's hard for these victims and their families uh, to want to continue to remain in the Catholic Church, not just because of the abuse or the cover up on the part of the bishops, but also, as you point out, because of how the Catholic laity do not support them. The same thing happened with with Anthony Gorge and the Knights of Columbus. He was a member of the Knights of Columbus, you know, in, in Staten Island. And then they even had his picture, you know, in, in the, uh, the Knights of Columbus Hall when he went to Rome to study in Rome. But then when he came back and he appealed to them, look what they did to me, they all ran away. They did nothing. So the Knights of Columbus, even the, the Supreme Knight in New Haven, Connecticut, did nothing. So, so you're right. I mean, yeah. who wants to be a member? I mean, that's very hard. For people to want to stay a part of an organization like that, especially when organizations like the Knights of Columbus and others who profess to be, oh, we want to encourage vocations. You know, the Knights are pushing vocations. But what? You go off to the seminary, you get abused and you report it. And what do they do? They, they let you down. So, no, I, I think you're right. A lot of those Catholic laity and some of those organizations, as well as the media, Catholic media, are, are, are a bunch of hypocrites. and 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 and, and, and I don't want to use those. I can't use those terms on. <laughs> I spent too many years in the military to be careful about using certain language. <laughs> but Gene, thank you so much. I, I could have talked to you for hours. It, it Personally, it helps me to talk this out because I still haven't figured out what happened or what's going on. I just, it, it's it's difficult. It's difficult. I can I can understand why the Pope and the cardinals and the bishops have done what they have done because I just think they're all corrupt. Yeah. Um, it's a little more difficult be for the priests because I've known so many of them and they are good men, but they've been they've been terrorized. And the laity, I don't know, except it's it's brainwashing. But it's it's. I think it's they sad. think that if if they, if they speak up, they're going to lose their <clears throat> all those premiums they paid for their eternal life insurance policy are going to be for naught. I mean, who wants to who wants to pay all this insurance and then not collect? Yeah, I know. People I, I think their, yeah. their their eternal salvation. They're not going to be buried in the Holy Roman Catholic Church, and they're going to go to hell if they speak up. So they have to get that. They have to make sure that they get buried in the Catholic Church. If they speak up, they're going to jeopardize that. Yeah, people have told me I'm going to hell, and I I bet they've told you that too. So. Oh yes. But they're the ones actually I think are going to end up there. <laughs> I know. Let's let's pray for them. So I, I guess it's difficult for me to pray for the church, but you know I do it on occasion. So. Me too. <laughs> God, God bless you, Gene. Thank okay, you. Okay, Joseph. It's a real pleasure being on your program. <laughs>